All right. Um, may I invite to the stage Professor Esther C.M., Dr. Julie Walang, Dr. Thiesenio Kiditsu, and Chitra Ahanthem. Kindly come and take your seats on the stage. Mary? Can we request everyone to please take a seat? Those of you behind, please come in front. And all of you sitting there, if you'd like to come and sit, take a seat here, please do. All the seats are for everyone. Uh, first come, first seated. So I welcome you to come into the venue, please. When I was thinking about through this program and its curation, I felt it would be apt to begin with a tribute to a person whose life and stories and work has resonated and inspired so many of us and will continue to. Temsula Au's memoir left a deep mark on me personally, and in some ways her story helped me to return to these hills I call home and to work to bring together all of our stories of our land, our people, our histories, our present, our many identities and more into this platform, the Shillong Literary Festival. Among her many works that have disturbed, shaken and shifted my perspective, her essay on being a Naga is one of them. I will read a few lines from it. It is a complex fate, being a Naga, but in our context it is a double-edged sword because the complexity lies not only in the way outsiders view us, but also in the way we see ourselves. Being a Naga has never been easy for us. The mystique and negative power of the savage has always fascinated the Western mind. And when we were discovered by anthropologists and ethnographers in the 19th century, we became exotic and exciting specimens for them to study but from their perspective only. Our material culture seems to have caught their imagination in such a manner that the best specimens were spirited away to their museums without any qualms because they, they were the finders and therefore the keepers. In Avanu Kire's words, in telling her stories, she told our stories too. She is the guardian of a people's history, a knowledge keeper, a trove of stories. And on that note, I will hand over to our moderator, Chitra, to begin this session with our speakers. to introduce our moderator for the session. Chitra Ahanthem is the former editor of Imphal Free Press, published in Manipur. Long-term journalist and always a book reader. She reviews books and hosts an online roundtable, books and conversations on Kulke. I now hand over the stage to you, Chitra. Very good afternoon. Sorry, we have to do a little bit of stage redecoration. But a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I just wanted to coordinate with the team. Is the video re ready? There is a five minutes video clip that has to be played. I'll do the introductions, and then if that's ready, then we can, okay, okay. So, thank you all for coming to this very first session. 
the very fir first session of the Shillong Literary Festival in its second edition is going to be... In this essay. Can we halt this, to, uh, this clip, please? Thank you. It's going, we are here to pay tribute to a writer, a poet, an educationist, an ethnographer, somebody we lost just last month, Temsila Ao, uh, the rest of people, uh, for the rest of the people and readers in the country, she was a writer. But for people in Sam, for the people in Nagaland, for the people in Meghalaya, and for so many people uh, for whom she spoke, for whom she wrote about, she was much more than just a writer. And that's why we are here to pay tribute to her life and her works. And I'm very honored to have with me a panel uh, that I'll be introducing. So we have, to my right, I have uh, Kiyosu Kiditsu. Uh, her pen name, she's mostly known as T. Kiditsu. She's an indigenous feminist, poet, academic, folklorist, writer, and educator. She's published two books of poetry. Uh, Sofuno and Wake, as well as Ukipenofu, an illustrated children's storybook. She is currently an assistant professor in Kohima College in Nagaland. And one of the things that she does is because Temsila Ao's short stories are taught in the undergraduate course in Nagaland University, she is in touch with a lot of young people who look up to Temsila Ao's work. So we are Looking forward to have your insights and your experience. Then I have to my left Esther Seem, who teaches English literature at the Northeast Hill University in Shillong, which is where Temsila Ao also taught. And uh, Esther has been involved in the study of Kasi oral narratives for many years. She's a bilingual author and has published works include poetry, a play, a fictional memoir of a river. Children's books and amongst others, she has translated Kasi uh, folk tales for children, and she is a member of the National Editorial Collective of the People's Linguistic Survey of India. Then I have Julie Sunwalang, an associate professor in the Department of English in the Union Christian College in Meghalaya. Uh, she has a lot of common interests with Professor Ao especially on the Native American literature, which has led to a PhD, uh, PhD and which was supervised by Professor Ao as well. Uh, so we are going to have a fruitful conversation. And, uh, but before we go into all of that, uh, if we could just stand for two minutes and pay our respects to Temsila Ao for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. From the program team, if I can have a, okay, does everyone have mics now? So we can start with the clip. Thank you. I want to share the thoughts that I had expressed in this essay. I had titled it Defining Humanity. Today I would like to consider the parameters which define us as what we are. 
But it is not an easy task because each one may have a different yardstick to define the self even within a well-articulated group. While thinking about this, my mind went back to my childhood and one particular Sunday school class where the teacher said something which struck me at once as the most mystifying thing that I had ever heard. He asked, do you sometimes look at yourselves in the mirror and ask the question, who am I? I do not remember in what connection he said this or if it, it was at all connected to any Bible lessons. But it aroused an urgent curiosity in my mind. So at the first opportunity when I had the only big mirror in the house to myself, I began to gaze at myself, trying to ask the question, who am I? The longer I looked, the more confused I became. I even thought that the image in the mirror was not me, but some look-alike who had nothing to do with my real self. This childhood experience often comes to me in times of stress and confusion, as if I'm still looking for some of the answers to life's puzzles in my mirror image only. But let us be practical. So I want to submit here two propositions which might be of some help in finding the definitions about who am I. I propose that these two are language and culture. The interconnectedness between these two most inalienable aspects of human existence is such that it often becomes impossible to talk of one without mentioning or without the aid of the other. Many are of the firm belief that language is not only the medium of culture, but also an integral part of it. Take, for example, the cases of immigrants settling in foreign countries who insist on preserving their languages in spite of the fact that they have to learn the language of their new domicile and which would be sufficient for their survival there. In such cases, their sense of identity is based not on the new environment, which they have chosen out of various compulsions, but on their native language and culture. It is as if their present reality is simply a mask to put on their original being. On the other hand, linguistic differences are often seen as cultural differences, which invariably lead to divisiveness. We do not have to search far for examples of this. Look at the history of the formation of separate states in our nation based on linguistic considerations. The irony of this situation is that culturally, they may remain as close as they were before the new demarcation demarcations of state lines were determined by language alone. However, there is no denying the fact that language is a great unifier of human relationships. In a strange place, when you hear your mother tongue spoken, I'm sure that your heart misses a beat and you want to connect with that person who shares this identity with you. If in modern times, language plays this bonding role, in earlier societies, in it provided security to the speakers of a language. Reversely, it also led to crises of survival for those outside the fold. This is, this 
a small snippet that we wanted to play uh, before the audience here. Uh, this, this was Temsila Ao, uh, her last public appearance, her last public speech. And as always, despite, her, despite the years that she had carried herself, you can, you can make out the way she is very clear about her roots, about who we are. And so here we are in Shillong to talk about her life. And uh, I'll come straight to you, Esther. Uh, you are a teacher in uh, English literature. And you are, in a sense, uh, somebody who has known of her works as well. So uh, I mean, when we talk about uh, Temsila Ao in terms of the work that she did, and, uh, and much before she was uh, known in the national consciousness, so to speak, in the literary world of India, uh, people here knew her as an ethnographer. We knew her as a poet. Uh, so when we look at the sum total of our writings now, uh, what, how would you sum up her journey as a writer and also as somebody uh, from the Naga community who in her lifetime also kind of set a bar in terms of the representation of the Naga you know, uh, expressions. Uh, because she was the first writer, so to say. Uh, because before uh, Temsila came on the scene, it was mostly Assamist literature uh, that, was, that was being talked about. And then we had her. Uh, so how do you look at her life, at her works, and her writing? And then we'll go on to each one of them. Thank you, Chitra. That's a very tall order for me to answer, because um, uh, you seem to want me to answer, to tell you everything about her journey, which is really very long. Um, where do I start? Because um, we've, uh, I've thought about her as a Naga writer, but I think I've always looked upon her as someone who was so closely associated with me. And the fact that um, she was responsible for opening up this huge area of um, what... Um, may be looked upon as writing that comes from a different part of India, which is Northeast India. Of course, she was first, um, she was first a poet. Um, it was only after 1997 that she started writing her fiction. I can say this for sure because uh, my room used to be opposite hers, and um, she would type her short stories, and we would sit and wait uh, impatiently, and you know, the computer that she used, the, the printer that she used was, an, was a very um, spent out rickety one, you know, and it was, a, uh, it was an inkjet dot matrix. And we'd impatiently wait for the papers to come. And the moment it come, I'd snatch it away from her fingers and I'd read them, you know. Now, um, when you talk about the kind of writer that she was, um, you know, um, she is a Naga writer, but first and foremost, I think she was a very human kind of person. And um, she was able to dwell. Uh, she was able to talk about things that mattered so much to many of us who are actually looking into the oral histories of our communities. So I think I would look upon her as a pioneer. I would look upon her as a feminist. I would look upon her uh, as a poet, most Im especially as a poet, because when I talk about her now, I especially think about one of the characters, one of the personas that she adopts. And this is taken from a poem called The Old Storyteller, you know? And um, when she talks, uh, she is not intellectual. She doesn't assume to be intellectual. She talks from the depths of something within her which gives her the kind of wisdom and understanding which um, I saw when I last visited her in December. And I think she knew that we were not going to meet again. You know, when we met her, uh, I had gone with uh, Madame Nola, same there, because three of us had worked together for a very long time. And uh, I knew that she knew that we would not meet again, but I didn't want that thought to, be, to come to my 
to my mind. But um, uh, she was very, um, you know, she doesn't speak much. But if you read her stories, you find that her stories flow, you know, flow as if, uh, you know, you sort of, uh, she's just opening out her thoughts to us. Um, I don't think I've answered your question because she's been so close to me that, you know, I can't look upon her in an academic way. But I hope I've, to a certain extent, answered something that you sort of asked me. respond to, uh, I mean, how do you look at her? Again, uh, for, for you, I'm sure it's going to be as difficult for you because she was your supervisor uh, when you did your PhD and uh, you were following on a path that she herself had trodden, uh, especially in the ethnographic area. Uh, how do you, how, how, I mean, is it possible for you to look back on, on her work and, and the work that she did and your association with her, if you can share it for the audience that we have, it would be such an insightful journey for us. Thank you, Chitra. Um, what do I tell you about uh, Professor Ao? We called her Madam Ao. The first time I uh, heard about her was when I joined college in St. Mary's. And I heard some of my friends speaking about a certain lady who they addressed as Ma Ao. And at first, I, I was rather surprised because Ma and Ao, somehow it, that didn't seem to go together. And um, I asked them, why do you address her as Ma Ao? Oh, you don't know her. So I, I, I suppose uh, th there could be any kind of connotations attached to that particular way that they addressed her. But, um, and then the next time that I met her was in the university. I had heard a lot about her. Unfortunately, I was not really her student because uh, when I joined the university, she was on deputation. Uh, but interestingly, I had heard so much about this lady and I always wanted to meet her. So when I finally got to meet her, it was during one of the seminar presentations, and I was there as uh, I, I was there in one of the presentations, and she was talking about this Native American writer, Navre Scott Momaday, and uh, I found her to be such an articulate storyteller, and she was not really presenting the paper. I think she was just articulating what she had studied. She was talking about her life. She was associating her life, her experiences, with the experiences that she had come across when she was in Minnesota. I think she did. A, she she had a stint at Minnesota, and and uh, instantly I felt a sort of a connection because um, I don't know what it is about the Native Americans, but even as a child, I felt some sort of a kinship with them. Uh, and uh, when she was speaking about Mama Day, I was determined that I was going to work on Native American literature and definitely it was going to be Mama Day. And uh, when I finally went for my um, uh, research work, I had spoken to uh, uh, Madam Mester and uh, she told me, I think you should be, s you should be working with uh, Professor Ao and I was a little um, hesitant in the first place because I was a little apprehensive. I didn't know how to approach her. When I did approach her, I thought she was such an approachable person, very unassuming, very witty, very funny, very humane. I think that is one quality that really defines her. And uh, instantly she said, we are going to do very well together. You are interested in working on something that I completely relate to. And I think she found a connection between the Native American journey uh, the, in terms of the cultural ethos and uh, the Nagas. When you're talking about uh, state militarization, when you're talking about uh, uh, the kind of things that Native Americans have gone through, you know, um, uh, let, let's not go there, uh, but 
you know, uh, I've always, um, maybe I have this uh, habit of romanticizing the past. Maybe I feel for the underdogs. And I felt that here is a kindred spirit, you know, when I met her, because she, she spoke about them as if she knew them, as if she was one of the community. And I felt, okay, here is a kindred spirit. And uh, when we started speaking, I felt that she was taking me along into a journey. You know, it was not just a narrative. She was telling a story, but she was also, uh, I was also a participant in that journey. And I felt alive. I felt so full of life. And, and instantly there was a connection. And I, I, I don't know whether you call that an epiphany or what, but uh, there was a connection. And uh, I was so determined to work under her. Unfortunately, she was going to retire and we had to rush. But what I want to share with everyone here is that, um, uh, you know, I was working in Union Christian College. I would go to college early in the morning, come back at around 3.30. I would reach the university at 4. And the first thing that she would ask me, hey, you must be tired. Sit down have lunch and there would be cup after cup of tea and she would give me lunch and uh, who does that <laughs> seriously who does that she she was my supervisor but she was a mother figure I don't remember my mother doing that when I went home tired in fact I was the one who would make tea and give mom and here was someone who was not just my teacher not just my supervisor she was a mother figure and uh, that is the one memory that I have with her that I would cherish all my life. And uh, I truly miss her. And when I spoke to other friends who were her students, I asked them, what do you remember about her? Everyone said she was so human. And another remarkable thing about her is that she remembered everyone by name. I think that is a mark of a really good teacher. That is what I have to share about that. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think it's in this small uh, anecdotes that we get to know more about a person that, I mean, we read about just in print in black and white, but it's, it's what's not written also that gives us a more uh, larger uh, look into the person and the work that she has done. Uh, Kiditsu, coming to you. You teach the UG course, an undergrad course in Nagaland Un University. Uh, how do the young generation of uh, students uh, take to her writing? How, if you can you know, approach Temsila's works through that lens, that would be interesting. Hello. Uh, I'm the only one who doesn't know Temsalao personally. Uh, I've only met her three times in my life. I'm Naga. I'm a Naga woman. I live in Nagaland, but I've never so... Um, now I understand the seating arrangement. I'm the odd one out. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, the thing is, I think if any of you have uh, studied literature here in this country, and um, especially if you've done English honors, um, for me, my generation, we, um, I think... I, I finished, I went up to my master's without reading anything from the Northeast, you know, and forget uh, reading something from the Northeast. I think I even did get to my master's without uh, reading anything from India. I think uh, during, I did my master's in DU and we had one paper that was Indian writings uh, in English or something like that. Uh, so, you know, uh, whether you want to or not, very sort of unconsciously, you kind of um, internalize a kind of colonial snobbery when it comes to writing that is not uh, Western, uh, uh, British, you know, all of that. So um, I was a very sort of, how to say, um, innocent snob, you know, who reads this? I mean, who, what, what is, uh, I mean, number one, you know, a snob in terms of just even Indian, uh, you know, writing. But what is this Northeast? What, you know, what are we going to read? And of course, you know, one or two attempts at reading um, the few writers from the Northeast, or f at, at that time it was just Nagaland. I was in Nagaland. It was, uh, you know, 
I, I wasn't, I didn't have any skills to read that. I'm not gonna say it was bad writing, but I think I didn't have a frame of reference and I didn't have skills to understand this very different kind of writing. Um, and then I started teaching in Nagaland University and the one paper, and one of the reasons why I agreed to do this panel is this is the last year I am teaching this paper. As of this year, uh, this current um, syllabus has been phased out and there will be no more uh, papers on Northeast writings or Naga writings in English in the undergraduate syllabus in Nagaland University. So I just want to, you know, I mean, I think um, with all due respect to uh, Madam Temsala Ao, I think we should have another one minute silence for that as well. Um, I'm in a state of mourning for that. Uh, so then I had to teach this paper and for me, you know, then I had to read it because I had to prepare for my uh, um, lectures. And reading Tamsala Ao, I know she's a poet, I'd read one or two of her poems before, but then reading uh, the book I have to teach is These Hills Called Home, uh, which is a collection of short stories. And it was just, you know, um, how to say, uh, a real, it was a revival. I'm a Baptist, so let me use the word. But it was really a kind of revival, uh, just, just to read that. Uh, because I think what sets Temsala Ao's uh, writing apart from other Naga writers is that, you know, um, she's, she really doesn't romanticize, exoticize. She doesn't have a kind of nostalgia when it comes to, you know, how we are or what we were like. You know, it is actually possible for us to read about our past without, you know, any kind of, you know, in, any rose-tinted glasses, etc. And especially, and also by then I was married. I'm a feminist. I was married. I was, uh, you know, so, sort of struggling with, you know, the patriarchal institution of marriage, just society, et cetera. And we Nagas were a very, very conservative society. You know, we're a very conservative society. And as women who decide to write, um, I think when we, as a Naga woman, when I read other Naga women writers, and at the moment we're predominantly mostly women writers in Nagaland, uh, you know, um, as a Naga woman, I see the kind of struggles that these writers are going through where they'll kind of skim, you know, somewhere near the boundaries of something transgressive, but they won't really go into it, they won't touch it. Um, they euphemize many of the things that, you know, um, are very much part of Naga women's realities. And in that context, to read Temsala Ao and have her talk, write about sex, desire, you know, passion, about feminine, you know, sort of uh, sexuality, uh, things like that. I just thought, wow, this is fabulous. And for me, I, I just, you know, um, it's, it's from, it's, she's, her, uh, her short stories are just part of a paper, but I always relish teaching her section because, you know, it's, um, you can, because I think, especially when it comes to Naga writings in English, magic realism is just overdone. And it's overdone, uh, you know, because I think there's only a certain kind of magic realism that's done. And I, with all due respect to everybody, uh, one of the reasons why that kind of magic realism is also starting to define what Naga literature is, is because I think it caters to, you know, the uh, imaginaries of the mainland. So, of course, you know, I mean, it, within the political economy of publishing, you know, it, it's marketable because then, you know, wow, you know, we're always dreaming, we're always exotic, or we're violent warriors, or, you know, all of that. So, uh, in the midst of all that, I think Temsalao is a very necessary part of, you know, uh, Naga writings and Naga literature in, in English. And so for me to teach students Temsala Ao is always, you know, um, a great privilege. I find that her short stories are um, a great way to start talking to them about really, you know, our realities because I think, as I'm going to speak only as a Naga, but I think for Nagas, you know, we have a lot of traumas, you know, not just of entering modernity in such sort of violent and, you know, sort of uh, dramatic ways, but also um, our conversion to Christianity, um, the nature of that conversion and the kind of sort of uh, cultural erasure that it, it involved. And uh, when you try to find writers through whom you can teach your your students, 
these sort of you know, ideas or allow them to explore what is happening to them in their own lives because of these you know, uh, uh, events, Temsalao is just perfect. And so in terms of responses, you, my classes are always the liveliest when I'm teaching Tamsalao, you know? And um, what I've stopped doing, because I've been teaching this for, this will be my last <laughs> and seventh year of teaching them this paper, is I've stopped giving them the option to choose which, uh, which writer they want to do their assignments on. Because <laughs> inevitably, maybe because of the way I teach it, you know, or because I have, you know, such partiality to her, uh, most of them choose to do Temsalao papers. So then I end up correcting, you know, like a whole class of Temsalao papers. So I've said, no, none of this. Um, one very special batch, I think it was four years ago that I taught, you know, they were so inspired by this um, short story, The Jungle Major, uh, that they even dramatized it. So that was a very special, you know, sort of moment for me to see them dramatizing the story. Uh, yeah, so, yes. What a story that was. Uh, it was, yes. Yeah, I think she has yeah. perfectly, uh, Keritsu has perfectly led on to the next question that I wanted to bring on board. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of stories, uh, the kind of ethos that she brought into the consciousness of readers who didn't know about uh, this part of the country, number one. The mm -hmm. kind of uh, horrific abuses that was happening in this part of the country. I mean, it would take... Uh, cases in the Supreme Court to highlight it uh, that, that came in much later. Uh, but the kind of stories that she wrote in this Hills Called Home, what sets them apart is, is that uh, you have the most heinous, gruesome details, gory, you know, violence happening. And at the end of it all, in all her stories, there is so much of humanity, there's so much of grace, and there is Sadly, acceptance, because that's how it is. You don't know how to cope, and so you cope unknowingly. You grasp at, stro at straws, you know. You go to a place of worship over centuries, and it's been desecrated. You have children being impaled, pregnant women being defiled. I mean, all sorts of things are happening. And yet, at the end of each story, uh, there's this sense of, humanity that reaches out to you. Uh, Professor Esther, for you especially, because you, for you, you saw those stories coming to life. You just told us about this anecdote where you were, you and your other friends were waiting for, you know, those stories to come to life and you were waiting for them to get printed out. Uh, maybe you can give us into an insight of, uh, these stories were real stories. It happened to a lot of people, not just in Naglin, it has happened in Manipur. It has happened in parts of Assam, uh, mostly in these three places. Mizoram, yes, there was a time when people of Mizoram also went through this. And yet you were at an age when you were also young. And uh, so how did you look at that point of time? That And how do you look back now after you see, I mean, there are young people now speaking about more about it more. There is more media representation uh, in terms of being able to articulate. And yet there was an entire generation that didn't know how to articulate. We didn't even know that our rights, what rights were there, right? Uh, so between the then and now, uh, how do these stories shape the articulation of all the anguish of all the violence that the people of this region has gone through, if you if you can tell us about that a little bit. I, I'm, I mean, 45 minutes is just too short for us to discuss about all of this, but tidbits, you know. Um, thank you for your question. I actually came here prepared to speak about her life because I've been so closely associated with her and I've known her since uh, the time that she sold me her first book of poems. And uh, that was in 1988. And I had just joined the university. And I looked upon her as someone much, much, much senior to me. Uh, we've uh, journeyed together. I'll be coming to your question. We journeyed together. We would sit together and exchange uh, talks and stories, especially oralities. 
she was very interested in the kind of oralities that my community had, you know, and I was very interested in what she always um, spoke to us about. Now, those were the days when she was, she was only known as a poet. Uh, when I first knew her much better, I mean, I had heard about her. She had left the department when I joined because she had joined the uh, Northeast Zone Cultural Center. She was director of the center for five years. And uh, I think it was when she came back, that was in 1997, that I began to know her as the kind of person who had this vision of um, wanting to do something, wanting to write something. And you know, if you look at the, uh, if you look at her over, you, know, you will find that um, the poems that were written before 1997 are very different from the kind of, of, of um, creative work that was brought out after 1997. Now, um, when she came back and took over as head of the English department, she always had this manuscript with her, and it was the manuscript of the Aonaga oral tradition. She would push it to anyone who was willing to listen, uh, willing to read. Uh, she would give it to me, and I remember the notes, the painstaking notes that she wrote on the side. Now, you would think that she was a very diligent person, but uh, this is where you know I find it very interesting that um, in these years that I got to know her, there was never any talk about what happened in Nagaland. You know, there was nothing. So that's why I see this very strange dichotomy between the kind of person that she was, very spare in her words, and the kind of writing that she was capable of. It's almost as if she's bottled up everything and she's going to come out in writing uh, because she never, she never clamored for any kind of attention in the sense that, you know, shouting, uh, talking to people and saying, we in Naga, we in Nagaland, we need this, 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 this. Nothing of that came from her. But it was all out in writing. And so when she wrote her, for her collection of poems, These Hills Called Home, where you know she would sit till late in the evening and she would tell us that she was so tired when she got back that the only thing she did was to watch the idiot box. She loved calling it the idiot box. She said that she'd always watch the idiot box with the helper who was with her and probably forget the stories that she wrote and she would sort of sit with the helper and try to guess who, what the villain was up to or you know, or what the lady love would be. And all the while, she'd come back to her stories and to her teaching. So, um, uh, you know, she would never, well, I would never call her an activist. I would never call her an activist. Um, she was an academic, she was a creative writer, but I think I come back to the point that you said that um, there's a great deal of humanity in her, especially when you look at that particular short story called Apenio's Song. I think this was uh, talked about when we met in Guwahati on Saturday. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was also in memory of Temsula Ao that we met on Saturday in Guwahati. And uh, mention was made of Apenio's Song by um, Dolly Kikon. And um, this was something that actually happened in the village that Dolly Kikon was in. And she pointed this out to Professor Ao. And Dolly Kikon herself said that she, sometimes she was very dissatisfied with Professor Temsula Ao's um, attitude towards what was going on, not realizing that this is how someone like Temsula Ao would react, not in the way that an activist would do, but in the way of someone who probably is able to see the larger pattern, who's able to see the larger plan, which is why I refer to a Penyu song. Because in a Penyu song, there's a sense of um, there's a sense of the song transcending over everything that happened in Nagaland, and I think this is the essence of Temsula Ao, of Professor Temsula Ao, that wherever you read now, even if you look at the last collection of short stories, and you look at the tombstone in my garden, there's always a sense of acceptance in the protagonist, and I think this is what makes her. Uh, or rather, this is something that stems from that very human element that Julie was talking about, you know? And um, if I'm not 
speaking too much, but I remember her, you know, when we had uh, this retirement of one of our office staff. You know, much of his retirement speech was about Professor Temsula Ao and how, what a kind of a mother she was, you know? So the term mother, Ma Ao, I think is something that had come to stay with many of us, with many of our students, because um, her office was always open to people, you know? And she had her ubiquitous pan, which she shared with anyone and everyone. And she had a lot of pan friends, you know? So if you were, even if you didn't want to eat pan, the Dimapur pan was what drew you to her. And she'd sit and eat it, and she'd tell me, she said, what do I do? How do I kick this addiction? But um, when I met her last, you know, before she passed away, she was able to sort of reduce her, her, her pan addiction. Now, I don't know if I've got to the point, but this is something I think that we have to, um, when we are trying to understand Professor Temsula Ao, I think there were two sides of her. One was the person who was very spare in her words, someone who sort of um, digested everything, someone who internalized everything that happened, so as to be able to come out with a story that, um, sort of looked at the human element that was always there. And so when you look at Jungle Major also, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pathos in that. There's a lot of tragedy in that. But there's also a, a, a great deal of commiseration. And um, before I stop, I think we must look to the introduction of these hills called home when she talks about history and she talks about the victims of history. And she talks about the fact that if you are if you want to look into the history of any, uh, any community, any nation, it's the victims. It's usually the victims who are left over. It's the victims whose stories come out much more than, than the victors. Thank you. Julie. Uh would you have anything to add to how, uh, I mean, we look at the, the expressions of the stories in uh, these stories, uh, this hills called home? Um, uh, when I, when I, um, I'm afraid I haven't done much reading, but then uh, when I read uh, at least some of the, that particular work, what really struck me was that, uh, there was no rancor in uh, whatever she was trying to express. Anyone would have done that when we talk about victimization of uh, women in a patriarchal society, especially when you have military presence in, a, in that space. Uh, but uh, like I said, there's no rancor. She, um, she's very succinct in the way she uh, uh, articulates the stories, uh, the poems, but um, uh, there was an occasion when we had discussed this and she said, you know, um, this is how I see things and this is how I'm going to express it, but there is nothing that is underlying this. This is how things are. And you have to just take it the way it is. If you have any sensitivity, I think you will be able to uh, relate to this. And I said, uh, ma'am, um, I see a lot of... Um, there is a parallel between the, uh, the sensibilities that you find in Native American literature and in what you have written. And all she told me was, just leave it at that. Just leave it at that. And um, I don't know, when, uh, when she said that, when she was talking about her memoir especially, she said, um, you know, she used the word remember, but it was hyphenated, remember. And it reminded me of Gary Hobson, who says remembering is all. In remembering, there is hope. And um, I suppose that's what she meant when she said, just leave it at that. This is just how I, uh, like uh, Professor Esther Siem has uh, mentioned, internalizing everything. But then at the same time, she was able to articulate every experience that she herself had felt or what the characters in her works have um, undergone, the journeys that they have undergone. And I couldn't help but um, relate it to uh, what the Navajos, Native Americans, what the Navajos called uh, Hojo Nahashdli. I hope uh, my pronunciation is correct. 
balance and uh, harmony being restored, peace being restored. And when you look at uh, Professor Temsula Au, you know, the grace with which she carried herself, that was what came to my mind, balance, beauty, and harmony. In spite of all the travails that she had undergone, if you read her memoirs, I think you will understand what we are really talking about. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we have been getting too many musical cues, like the Oscar award, uh, but, but because uh, the moderator decides everything, we still have the last question. <laughs> And just to wrap up things, and then we'll take it, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Sorry, because uh, what uh, Professor Esther had said earlier, I thought it's very relevant to bring it here. What Esther had said earlier about uh, Temsela Ao's own nature about not reacting to things, and then uh, it comes forth in her writings. Uh, but also, I was wondering that when the community goes through horrific trauma time and again. Uh, and then you have to run through your life, uh, run for cover, run to survive, uh, and then wait for the next round of trauma. You actually are in a space where you are not really able to articulate. Mm. And maybe it's just us, the new generation, uh, who are suddenly getting this space to articulate. And if we don't get a space, we stomp, right? we stomp our feet and say, we need to speak. But for an earlier generation, maybe that wasn't so, because uh, it was not just Temsila Ao, but even if we look at our elders who lived through trauma, they do not speak at all. Uh, and this is something that I find in common with, uh, say, the victims of the partition, horrors of the partition, that uh, the survivors do not speak at all. They just, they just shut that experience down. And maybe when something happens, it triggers, uh, you know. So uh, to you, uh, Kiditsu, the last question, because you yourself are a writer. So in your writing, are you able to express the, the kind of traumas that you, our generation goes through and that the earlier generation has gone through? OK, that's not the musical cue. That's uh, aircraft above. So you can answer that, yeah. You know, I think it's so interesting that, you know, you brought this up because, uh, again, just because I teach this, uh, you know, book of short stories, I think it's so interesting. I always tell my students that in the midst of all these stories, Damsalao has, I think, very deliberately tucked in a little story about a woman who has, you know, uh, an affair, and uh, you know, it, it's not rape, it is a beautiful sort of, you know, it's, 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 she's responding to her own desire, she has an affair, she gets pregnant, and then, you know, most of the story is her waiting for, you know, uh, the men in her family to defend her and see whether that man is going to claim uh, her child. Um, and I, I think it's just sort of, you know, such a masterful uh, move for her to do that, because when you talk about trauma, etc., we forget, especially as women, we forget, you know? One of the things about being from the Northeast, especially again in Nagaland, is our trauma is always, you know, the highlight, the trauma that is highlighted and gets a lot of attention is our militarized, you know, the, the inv in Indian invasion of Nagaland and current Indian occupation of Nagaland. But, um, what about our trauma, yeah? Within patriarchy, with the kind of traumas we face, you know, and Damsala is somebody, she's, I mean, whether she's, whether it's up in your story, whether it's jungle major, whether it's, you know, she, she actually has, you know, sort of, uh, you know, militarization in her stories, or it's that little beautiful, I mean, that's my favorite story. Um, she, she, in the midst of everything, women are also, you know, negotiating uh, patriarchal structures, uh, strictures. Uh, so for me, you know, um, if, if there is a way as a writer, you know, and as a feminist who wanted to or tries to write in a indigenous Naga way, in a way that, you know, at least for me, my journey as a writer at the moment is, how do I write in the way that only I can write? How do I write not, you know, uh, to cater to um, market preferences or other ideas? How do I write as resistance? Um, and for me, Tamsala Ao serves as a wonderful template, you know, because she really, you know, sort of, if 
and, and very important, you know, because I'm a feminist, but I think for me, increasingly my journey, I've realized, okay, I'm also an indigenous woman and I need to, you know, sort of see how I can, what, what does indigenous feminism mean? And what does indigenous feminism, I think when we start talking about indigenous feminisms, specificity becomes very important, nuance becomes very important, which is why I'm a little sort of uh, maybe allergic to this category of Northeast also, you know, I think, and even when we say, you know, uh, I mean, I just, I was, I was just telling uh, um, Julie that after Kublai, she, I said, what's the other word? She said, it's, uh, you know, uh, in Garo, that's the thank you in Garo. So I said, what about Jantia? She said, no, it's Kublai. So the thing is, my suggestion for future Meghalaya events is that if you really want to be inclusive, then say Kublai, Kublai, and then, you know, because you know, one of the things that I think especially outsiders don't understand or maybe they choose not to understand, but at least in the Northeast, especially if you're from the Northeast, it is important for us to be specific. So even if I speak as a Naga writer, I have to tell you, I'm not just Naga, I'm an Angami, I'm a half Sema. I don't speak for you know people from other tribes. I don't speak for women from other tribes. I don't speak for rural women because I'm an urban educated woman. You know, woman. So uh, these things are important and for me, Temsala Ao pays attention to nuance. You know, uh, her characters are very sort of well thought out, nuanced women. Uh, you know, women that you can recognize, women uh, who are like your, like ourselves. So, I think that's important. And how she does her feminism, I think, has been highlighted by my uh, co-panelists. But hers is such a non-violent feminism. You know, it's. If, if there is something that we feminists, I'm not even going to say from the global south, we feminists, indigenous feminists, can teach feminists across the world is, yes, there is absolute in, uh, absolutely an on alternative to, you know, raging, bra-burning feminism. And so for me, you know, I learned so, mo so much about how to do feminism through Tem Salau's works, and I, I mean, my gosh, a suddenly feeling of great sense of loss that she has passed, but I think she's left enough, you know, uh, for us to sort of, uh, you know, develop, for us younger women, younger writers, younger feminists to develop, or, you know, uh, feminisms that are peaceful, and one minute, so finished. <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, any questions from the audience? <laughs> Jerry? Yes, we have, we have. We were planning to read, uh, Professor will be reading uh, a favorite poem of Temsala. October? Yes. Um, actually, I had brought this book because I wanted to read this poem. It's entitled October, and it talks about the time when she wants to die. She was born on October 25th, and she passed away on October 9th. And, um, I found that there was a lot of Temsula Ao in this poem because she was a person who seemed to have some kind of intuition uh, about the future, about people. And this was something I encountered a lot when I spoke to her. So this is a poem that uh, many of her family members have also been sharing on social media. It's entitled October. October is the month which has a way with my heart and turns it nostalgic with its magic. October is the month when the winter is not yet a threat and the summer still a warm and lovely just past happening. October is the month when the golden ray of the autumn sun luxuriates upon the abundance and ripeness all around. October is the month where I always want to be, daring winter and not letting summer go. Just listen to the last verse. And when the time is ripe for me, I wish to depart with October in my heart. And she died on 9th October. With that, we end our first session. Thank you so much, Mary, for putting this together. I thank my panel for the lovely conversation that we had. And, but just 
45 minutes is just not enough to speak about this woman, this woman who, Ma'au, long live Ma'au, that's all I can say. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.